Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, you may be seated. In the gospel lesson for today from St. Mark chapter 8, verses uh, 1 through 9, it says, Jesus fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. But let me read it again in the ESV. We did it in the New King James, but I did my sermon in the ESV, so it's a few words are a little bit translated a little different. But it says, In those days when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, and he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said, that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. So bread is often mentioned in, in the Bible. One com concordance lists bread uh, 330 times. And bread can have more than one meaning, though usually bread means food. I think in older days bread meant money and stuff. Maybe that's going back pretty far, I don't know. But the Greek word for bread can mean literally bread, or it can mean food in general. And Jesus also tells us to pray for our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer. So you can see the Bible uses the word bread in a number of ways. But as I said, bread is generally used to describe food. And the reason bread could be described as food in the scriptures was because bread back then, back in the ancient days, was much more nutritious. Today, bread, it just depends. It's not always that good for you. I think Ezekiel bread is probably pretty good. It comes from a Bible from Ezekiel, from one of the verses in there. But in the gospel today, it says a great crowd had been listening to Jesus for three days, and Jesus was concerned because they had nothing to eat. He didn't think they could make it home because they were in a, a desolate place. The Greek word for desolate can also be used for wilderness. The King James did say wilderness, whereas ESV uses desolate. But it's the same word used in St. Matthew 4.1 when Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So they were far away, they were far from anywhere that they might find bread. And Jesus feared that if he sent them home, you know, they might faint on their way. We don't know if they'd run out of food recently or had been so caught up with Jesus' teaching that they uh, hadn't eaten for days. Either way, Jesus had compassion on the crowd, it says. Jesus always has compassion for his people as well as for the lost. As J.C. Ryle writes, and I know Pastor or Dr. Rutt and I quote Ryle quite often, but if you don't know who Ryle is, he was during the Victorian age, and he did become a bishop, first bishop of Liverpool around 1880, and he died in 1900. But he was a Church of England minister. But Ryle writes, Let us observe in this passage how great is the kindness and compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. He saw around him a, great, a very great multitude, who had nothing to eat. He knew that the great majority were following him from no other motive than idle curiosity and had no claim whatever to be regarded as his disciples. Yet when he saw them hungry and destitute, he pitied them. The feeling heart of our Lord Jesus Christ appears in those words. He had compassion even on those who are not his people, the faithless, the graceless, the followers of the world. He feels tenderly for them, though they knew, they knew it not. He died for them, though they care little for what he did on the cross. He has a special love beyond doubt for his own believing people, but he has also a great love of compassion for the unthankful and the evil. His love surpasses knowledge. So Jesus asked the disciples, how much food do they have? And they said seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. Then Jesus proceeds, or Jesus tells them to have the people sit down and Jesus proceeds to feed the 4,000 or more people with seven loaves of bread. Now, this isn't the first time Jesus feeds such a large crowd with so little resources. All four Gospels record that Jesus fed a crowd of over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. 
But St. Matthew and St. Mark both record a second time that Jesus feeds a crowd of 4,000, as we read in today's Gospel. Interestingly, some scholars believe Mark wrote the same story twice, thinking maybe he had forgotten what he had written the first time. Again, Ryle writes, Once more we see our Lord feeding a great multitude with a few, with a few loaves and fishes. He knew the heart of man. He foresaw the rise of cavaliers and skeptics who would question the reality of the wonderful works he performed. By repeating the mighty miracle here recorded, he stops the mouth of all who are not willfully blind to evidence. Publicly and before 4,000 witnesses, he shows his almighty power a second time. So it's kind of ridiculous then to say Mark forgot what he wrote or repeated the same miracle twice. Because later though, in St. Mark 8 verses 19 through 20, it says the disciples were worried because they'd forgotten to bring bread, or they only had a little bit of bread, and they were crossing a, the lake on a boat. And Jesus says to them, And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And the seven, and the seven for, four, for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? So Jesus himself confirms that he had done the miracle, did the miracle twice here. So do you think Jesus ever gets frustrated with his disciples? He had recently calmed a storm, walked on water, healed the sick, healed a deaf man, and fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. And now after all that, Jesus had, all that Jesus had done in verse 4, the disciples asked Jesus, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And to be even more annoying, after Jesus feeds the 4,000, the Pharisees later show up and they ask Jesus to show them a sign from heaven. And what does it say Jesus does? It said in St. Mark 8, 12, that he sighed deeply. He sighed deeply, listening to the Pharisees. When we lack faith or understanding what Jesus is doing, we shouldn't be too discouraged, right? The disciples were with Jesus every day, and yet they often didn't get it. They often didn't understand right away. Then at verse 4, the disciples asked Jesus, where then, where then can they find enough bread in this desolate place? And this would remind the people of Moses in the wilderness. The word desolate, as I said, can mean wilderness. Not that they were in some dried up desert location, but they were far away from any place or town. Therefore, the people would have, um, <clears throat> therefore, the people would have been reminded of Moses and how Moses had fed, fed the people in the wilderness with manna. Jesus was letting them know that someone greater than Moses was here. And as Jesus tells them in St. John's Gospel, it wasn't Moses who fed them with manna, but, it was, but that the manna came from God. And after feeding the 4,000, it says they gathered up seven baskets. Seven, seven often means completeness. Now, they were probably in Decapolis, so the crowd would have been a mix of Gentiles as well as Jews. And as Sinclair B. Ferguson writes, the crowd was probably a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles, perhaps none of them deeply committed, but awakened by the presence and teaching of Jesus and hungry to listen to him. In this case, the feeding of the multitude foreshadows the gathering together of those from every nation under heaven to the heavenly feeding of God's people. So in this case, the seven represents, the case of seven represents that with the coming, that with the coming of Christ, all things were completed, and that the gospel would now go out to all the nations. Now, I want to look at three ways Jesus feeds us then with bread. First, he literally feeds us with bread as he supplies our, all our needs. We pray, give us this day our daily bread, and he does. These people were in a desolate place where there was nowhere to, to find food, and Jesus feeds them. Jesus was their only resource. It wasn't like we have today where there's a market or a 7-Eleven or the QT on every corner. But the Lord always supplies our every need. In Psalm 37, 25, David says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. So again, the point is God will take care of us. And second, God feeds us with his word. When Jesus had fasted 40 days in the wilderness and the devil tempts him to turn stones into bread, Jesus tells him, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's from Matthew 4.4. 4. 
So we need to not only feed our bodies, we need to feed our souls. We need to feed on the Word of God. In St. John 6, after Jesus had fed the 5,000, it says the crowds were following after Jesus. But Jesus rebukes them because they were only following him because, because he fed them with the bread. Jesus tells them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. That's John, St. John 6, 26. So Jesus is not saying don't labor for your daily bread, but what's more important is the bread that gives you eternal life. And what does Peter have to say about all, all this when the people were offended by Jesus in John's Gospel, or offended by Jesus' words, and began to leave? Jesus asked the disciples if they were going to leave too. And Peter says in St. John 6, 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So words of eternal life. And if the scripture contains the words of eternal life, shouldn't, shouldn't we want to read it? Therefore, the Lord feeds, us, feeds both our body and our soul. Then it says in Mark 8, 3, that some of them had come from afar. They seem to be working backwards in the numbers here, but in verse 3, they says they'd come, a lot of them came from far away. Many of the people had traveled a great distance to hear Jesus speak the word of God. And in the year 1800, there was a girl named Mary Jones, and she lived in Wales, and she was 16 at the time. And there had been a revival some years earlier, and many people wanted a Bible, including Mary. Now, it wasn't like it is today. Bibles were hard to come by. They didn't have Christian bookstores on every, in every town, or they didn't have Amazon. And Bibles were very expensive. But Mary saved her money, which wasn't easy to do because her family was very poor. But after six years, she had saved enough to afford a Bible. It seems hard to think of that today, that, that hard to get a Bible back then. Now, the only place to buy a Bible at that time was 25 miles away. So Mary, and this is a true story, Mary walked 25 miles, they say, in her bare feet to get a Bible. She had to walk to the parish of Thomas Charles in Bala. And when she got there, they were sold out. But because she was so heartbroken, Thomas Charles sold her one of the copies that he had promised to someone else. So today I sometimes think, you know, sometimes we might take the Bible for granted. We have so many translations and so many styles. We can get it on our phone, computers, anywhere. Yet, do we read the Bible like the earlier Christians? Think of the reformers in England in the early 1500s and how, they, how the authorities wouldn't allow the Bible to be printed in English. The punishment for owning a Bible in English was often death. Yet many people risked their lives to own a copy of the scriptures. And William Tyndale himself was put to death. He was the first person, the first man to uh, translate the New Testament from the original Greek into the English. And for, his, for doing that, they uh, executed him. But we have now got the Word of God ever since in English. So don't take the Word for granted. It contains the words of eternal life. The psalmist said, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. So feed on his Word by reading his Word. And third, we are fed by Jesus at the Lord's table. We are fed by Christ during Holy Communion. When Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples during Passover, and before he went to the cross, while they were eating, it says in Matthew 26, 26, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of, drink, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, we see God feeds us literally each day with our daily bread. He feeds us by his holy word, and he feeds us with the bread and wine, his body and blood, when we receive the Lord's Supper. And let me end with this. After Jesus fed the 4,000, it says they were satisfied. The New King James says they were full. They were full. It's kind of the same idea when you eat and get full, hopefully you're satisfied. But the ESV says they translate or translates it satisfied. So can we say the same thing? Are we satisf satisfied with Jesus? Is he all that we need? Often people say all we need is Jesus, and in a sense it's true, but actually I always think, well, we actually need our daily bread. We actually need somewhere to live. We actually need our family. We need a job. We need a lot of things, but first and foremost, we need Jesus. 
Is he the most important thing then in our lives? Is Jesus the most important thing? Often there are many distractions throughout the day, but at the end of the day, can we say we're satisfied? Are we filled and full of the things of God? After we've been fed with, with our daily bread, with the word of God and with the body and blood of Jesus, are we satisfied? May God help us to be satisfied. Amen.